Um, I think our position has been pretty clear. Um, we are a European university, we are an international university. So yes, my name is Lizzie and I'm here from Royal 1251AM. I am the Head of News and I'm also here with my good friend James Ryan who is the Head of Factual Programming. So uh, with the looming EU general date on 31st of October and uh, a potential DV, uh, deal only agreed just moments ago within the last few hours this morning, um, uncertainty is obviously rife in the current political climate. How has this affected university life and what sort of roles or things are you doing in the administration to tackle these issues? Is there a deal? Is that what they're saying? As of a few hours ago, Boris Johnson said there is potentially a deal. Yeah, I don't believe it for a minute. So... Anyway. <laughs> uh, we'll see what we get. So we've, we've had uh, a huge amount of work really ongoing for three years um, because this, um, this process has dragged on very, very painfully. I think the first thing to say is, of course, it really affects real people's lives real people's futures, their kids' futures, what is going to happen has been incredibly unclear and uh, as I've said on uh, many occasions in uh, different bits of the media, um, the way in which government has handled this has been disgraceful. So where we are now is um, we've had to have a whole series of, uh, of work streams. Um, we have some stockpiling, not a lot, but we have some stockpiling in some areas. Apparently the, the top advice is if you are worried about no deal Brexit, buy toilet roll. Um, we've not got a, a lot of stockpiling in a number of places because, of course, in, in terms of foodstuffs and whatever, we, we source a lot locally. So we, we don't, in terms of uh, food and so on, have the same sorts of problems that other institutions have. But we do have issues that affect um, colleagues, their futures, and whether they feel comfortable to work in this country or not. It's a national problem rather than a work specific problem. But we've been working hard with people to try and support them getting settled status in terms of uh, making sure the contracts are clearly supporting them in their future. Uh, we've tried to do a lot of work with students as well. I mean, it's extraordinary that here we are today and I have to ask you, is there a deal or not? And we're supposed to be going out in a couple of weeks' time? I mean, I, I struggle to imagine um, any other aspect of public policy that's been handled so catastrophically. Um, personally, I am uh, profoundly, deeply worried about what's uh, been going on. No deal is catastrophic for this country. Um, it is catastrophic for this region. It may not be catastrophic for the university because we have a lot of international networks already. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things we've been doing for the last few years in terms of trying to prepare for all this is to, to build um, a network across, across Europe uh, which would be strong and long-lasting and uh, we worked hard to get a European University Network Award for that grouping of universities. Uh, the launch of that will be on the 1st of uh, December and it gives us a really strong structure for a student exchange, joint programmes, um, staff exchange, research activity in the future. So there's a number of areas that we've had to plan for. We, we have um, also colleagues who are on, um, whose job contracts are based on funds from the European Union and we've had to work hard with other universities to make sure the government will support uh, those projects, uh, underwrite those projects in the next period of time. If you cost it up all the time and energy in this university, and other organisations that have gone into this, it would be an extremely large number. I tend to say a bit more than that, but Peter doesn't like me going over the top. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so last year the university saw a fall in the rankings, most notably out of the UK top 10 in the Complete University Guide 2020. Do you see such rankings as holding much importance, and if so, what will the knock-on effects be for the university, and what steps has the university taken to address this? So uh, the purpose of rankings is to make money for people who make rankings. That's the purpose. <laughs> right? so, so if you chase rankings, you're in a difficult position. Um, we've just had, in contrast to the Complete University Guide, we've just had the Times Higher World Rankings, at which we're at our highest ever position. It's quite interesting, that, because one of the reasons we're at our highest ever position in the World Rankings of the Times is because the citations for research have gone up. In the QS World Rankings, we've just gone down because our research citations have gone down. And the reason, of course, is that they're measured in different ways. One's an absolute score, and one's divided by numbers of staff. So the methodology is, is all important in all this. And if you are a ranking agency and you want to make money, what you have to do is you have to produce change every year. 
and the only way you can produce change every year, no one's interested in the ranking if it's the same every year. Imagine the Premier League being 1 to 20 the same year, uh, every single year. The only way is to change methodology. So a lot of methodology has changed recently uh, to the extent to which in The Guardian, King's College London, you will find, is the 65th best university in Britain, which is stretching credibility beyond any kind of measure. What we're doing, to answer the second part of your question, is we're focusing on the core. So the core is, how do we have better education, better educational outcomes across a whole range? How do we have better research, better research outcomes across a whole range? And then report that and look at this as a long-term uh, long uh, project. If over time, the trend across the board is downwards, then there was something else to look at. In this period where methodologies are changing so much, I think we just have to do that. So the university has just declared a climate emergency and set out a number of proposals to address this issue, but with a record number of students, high levels of construction and poor public transportation options, is this merely sort of a publicity stunt on behalf of the administration, particularly because all other universities appear to be doing this? Uh, no. But you'd like it more, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's it's, it's um, a hugely important part of what we are and what we're trying to do. So the point of declaring the emergency is to start work, uh, not to make declarations of what we're doing. We might do lots of things and we can get onto some of that, but to start work. So um, the work that we need to deliver, for example, is around the transport strategy. There are key elements to a transport strategy, um, which are around, for example, trying to get a railway station um, that sits between Kenilworth and Coventry for people coming up from, uh, from Leamington to try to get the light rail system that we're designing here on campus uh, into Coventry, from Coventry to the hospital and from Coventry station down to here um, to work really hard on electric and autonomous vehicles on campus to get people around uh, and also through an accommodation strategy to work with students to understand how much demand there could be for more students to live in, on, or around campus, which again would take uh, a number of uh, transport miles out. We would love, I would love to get to a place where there are no um, petrol driven vehicles at all on campus. And you know, maybe we can get there fairly quickly. We, we've got at the moment um, some routes that we'll be consulting on quite soon for the autonomous vehicles, with a view to the first prototypes being on campus next year. Um, if they're on campus next year and the prototyping works, then we'll be able to start running far more of that. The next phase is to run some of those vehicles from here to Tarnhill Station, getting onto public roads. That might be the following year, but you know, with a little luck it might be earlier, and again that's a fantastic proof of concept. So we're trying to get um, as much as possible real momentum into that whole transport side. That's not enough though, we um, need to think about energy as well, we've always done a lot on energy, uh, we're at the moment we're working hard to make sure that um, more if not all of our energy, uh, our electricity comes in from renewables, renewables only for uh, next year and beyond. Um, we generate a lot of, uh, of, uh, of power ourselves over the last few years. I think that the great leap forward would be, um, if we think about the campus as a whole, the university owns a lot of fields. Uh, those fields soon will be um, slightly boxed in by HS2 if HS2 uh, carries on. Either side of that, there are um, significant areas of land designated for housing. So can we work together with the local authorities and developers so that we can produce ourselves large amounts of green electricity on that land that will not only supply uh, this campus but also those new houses on either side? If we could do that, it would be a fantastic demonstrator. That's not enough either um, because you know, clearly one of the things that we need to do is, is to think about um, everyday living. Um, you know, we, we have all learned our behaviours are all conditioned by uh, use and dispose. Uh, and you know, the most difficult thing, perhaps of all, is going to be how we give, collectively, it's not a university administration job, it's a community job, how we give incentives to people to think more harder about our lifestyles and what we use and what we throw away. I think it's a huge programme of work. Um, getting to a position of carbon zero by 2030 is phenomenally hard. Uh, absolutely, people will say it's not fast enough. Um, but if that's our first aiming point, that's a pretty good aiming point. We need to secure quite a lot of investment, and I don't just mean by that money, I mean investment of people's energy, time, and commitment to come up with good ideas and just change the way people behave. Um, so I think it's a huge amount to do, it's a huge program of work, it's a community thing, not a university administration thing. And um, I think there's real energy for it, I think there's a real will for it. Um, one of the things I've noticed over the, the last year is whether 
it's at our university governing council or meetings with students or meetings with academic departments. Everybody wants to do something. So now let's try and agree what is it we're going to do and get on, learn and, and move, uh, move forward to a, a future that the, the climate emergency feels a little further away than it does at the moment. Okay, so looking, obviously you have talked a lot about transport. I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to ask even more about it. Um, so exciting. Um, so obviously you have mentioned today and in last year's interview the plan to improve uh, public transportation from Leamington Spa um, with sort of a train station, but obviously with the controversy surrounding HS2 and its sort of unsteady footing. With the student population increasing and sort of other issues, what do you have sort of plans, especially with the students' union saying they really are this year going to improve the community, especially from Leamington, because the majority, a lot, all the, all the second years, we all live in Leamington. What is sort of you mentioned within the year, with the year after that, what are you going to do sort of, if anything, immediately to help this? Because obviously we deal with it on a daily basis, the commute from Leamington to campus with the buses. There is severe overcrowding. What, if anything, can be done in the immediate, either, obviously before Christmas, that is a very short time period, within the next year, another short time period, is there anything that can be done immediately to help students like us? So there's about 7,000 or thereabouts students in the Leventon, mm -hmm. Leventon area um, and about 7,000 or thereabouts in the Coventry area and, and one of the things that's been really noticeable uh, recently is a lot of the growth has been in the Coventry area rather than the Leventon area. There has been growth but it's, it's stayed relatively as a number relatively stable and one of the reasons for that is what you've just described. Yeah. You know, it's a real challenge getting, uh, getting to and from. Um, we have, um, as I'm on camera, I shall now go into diplomatic mode, uh, engagements with the bus companies, uh, as does the SU, um, about crowding, about service, about time. We've, uh, I think we and the SU together um, have enlisted quite helpful support, particular local member of parliament, that Western is mm -hmm. incredibly powerful in this space, um, incredibly um, articulate and uh, very, very determined. Because one of the other problems, as you will well know, is the air pollution problem, uh, which is exacerbated by the nature of the buses. So um, we are uh, part of a group which actually includes the district council, um, talking to the bus companies about timing and about um, capacity, uh, and also about possibility, and I better not say too much about this, of um, uh, additional capacity um, okay. to come up and down, which might not be provided by that bus company. Right. We've just hired somebody uh, to come in as, a, as our transport lead and, and his, his job is what progress can we really make in this space for very quickly. Because as you say quite rightly that the railway station will be transformational but it's not going to happen in the short term. You know, um, we've got so it is the number one uh, rail project now for Warwickshire County and the county is the transport authority so that really is an important step forward. And it is registered with the railway authorities and it's registered with the Department of Transport. So all that first space work is done, it's in place that's been achieved over the last year, but now we have to get to the difficult piece of so when and how and all the rest of it. And exactly as you say, HS2's future is critical to that. Um, so um, there are many possible outcomes to the, the HS2 review. My, my, my personal expectation is that we will have it still um, going into Birmingham. Um, how much of it goes north, I don't know. Um, I suspect it won't be very quick. Uh, it'll be slow high speed or whatever <laughs> even we will come up with. But in a sense, if it's about capacity, uh, more capacity and regeneration, I'm not sure that matters hugely. If, if that does still go ahead and on the time track that we're talking about, that will give us a timeline for that railway station, because that railway station would be exactly where HS2 would comes across the existing line going up, because that land is already bought by, by HS2. So that would give us a timeline and something to work to, um, and then we just have to work on getting a better route from there onto campus. Mm -hmm. um, but the first Im initial challenge that you quite rightly said is what can we do through our transport uh, engagements this year to improve that, that um, bus service, which I'm told, uh, I don't know if I dare say this, is better than it used to be. Don't discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Just reject. <laughs> try, try getting on the bus at any time after three o'clock during the day. <laughs> Yeah. I see the cues. Mm. Uh, so there have been widespread allegations that you, Stuart Croft, are actually Disco Dave. Can you respond to such rumours? Who? <laughs> <laughs> you do know who Disco Dave is. I think that this is scurrilous 
fake news, <laughs> absolutely outrageous fake news, and I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I don't know who Disco Dave is. He is the he is the DJ at the weekly pop. It's a Wednesday event. I know what pop is. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you tell me about this, Peter? Duff? Like, yes, like, it, seems like, it seems like an act to cover up that you're actually in fact going to do. Do you know, I'd love you to put that out. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> so, uh, tomorrow sees the opening of pret a on campus, a high-end sandwich chain that many see as, sort of as the epitome of the lack of affordable food options here. Um, this combined with the construction of Cryfield Village with, uh, student accommodation, which will rank as one of the more expensive accommodation options on campus, seem to indicate a wider trend that the university is not concerned with catering towards us affluent students, yet what provisions is the university taking on this front? Um, so, from what I've seen so far, Pret is going to be really popular. So, um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's look at the, the, the general rather than the specific, I think that, that would be a good thing. We have uh, some of the lowest cost uh, accommodation on campus uh, of any Russell Group institution, and, and that's deliberately so. And we've got a, a ladder of rents which we work every, hour, every year with the SU to agree uh, the ladder and the, the races in it to try to do exactly what you describe. What is incredibly interesting in the last few years is that the demand from students is lowest at the cheapest end. So uh, we, we're doing a lot more work at the moment trying to understand what, what that is and, and how that can be the case because the number of students from um, uh, less financial advantage background is increasing quite significantly. So, so something is going on there that we need to, need to understand um, in, uh, in in quite a bit more in quite a bit more detail. That's not to say there's going to be radical change in policy. It's just to say it's something we need to understand a great deal more there. That will be part of the uh, accommodation strategy work that we're, we're doing this year. Um, now, affordability and and uh, unaffordability. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do is to create in some of the spaces we were just talking about uh, more opportunities for people to make their own hot drinks, especially around the library and so on. And to again to try and work and uh, to talk with students about when we're thinking about um, dwell spaces as opposed to simply study spaces, what other facilities would actually really help? Because uh, there's no point in me thinking about it because I don't living as it were so we need to understand for people what that will be and we, we've done quite a lot about that and we'll do quite a lot more around that. Oh. Um, so the ill mental health of university students is a recurring subject uh, covered in the national news. Um, do you think that the current mitigating circumstances and extension systems at Warwick work for students who apply for them due to mental health? So <coughs> let me answer that in, with three bits. First bit um, I get very uh, frustrated with the national debate about mental health issues and students because um, actually if you look at all the data, the challenges around mental health are young people as a whole. It's not, just, it's not a student specific problem. Um, in fact, very, very slightly, it's less likely to be the case if you're a student than if you're not a student. Um, what do we then do with that as a, as a university? Well, I think the second thing I want to say is that um, over the last 10 years, whatever your politics, um, austerity has bitten really deeply and what austerity has done is it's hollowed out the state and there are a series of areas where we can see this. We see this in the police where we have to, we have to carry out more police functions now because there are fewer police officers and we see this in lots of areas of health. So mental health provision now must be provided by the universities because you get such relatively less good uh, support from the NHS. I was making sure I wasn't saying the wrong thing there. Uh, less good from the NHS. So now in the new system that we brought in, I'm getting to your third point. <laughs> the new system we brought in um, is, is one of, of specialism and uh, speedy reaction. So somebody arrives, says they've got a, a challenge at wellbeing uh, in terms of mental health, or a parent is in touch, a family's in touch, friends are in touch, a teacher is in touch, but somehow there is that first connection. That person will be seen that day then they will have specialist support and assessment within two weeks. In many parts of the NHS, that will take you 18 months. Now, that then provides for us, so I'm not getting to the answer to your question, um, that now provides for us a completely different basis of information and engagement to think about how we deal with issues around, for example, mitigating circumstances. So we had a big reform last year of mitigating circumstances which went through Senate uh, in the July uh, meeting to think about how we do this um, more efficiently, uh, even more humanely, 
in an even more engaged way. And we'll be rolling some of that work out this year. But it's going to be a really important project with the SU to understand how that rolls out, but also to how to understand how this hopefully greatly improved system of support can be connected into that to help support those students who have those kind of challenges. So sort of following on from you talking about the wellbeing resources here at the university, would you say they are able to cope with the increasing demand with of the university population? Because obviously it's increasing year on year on year. Um, is the right support in place for the students who need it? So uh, today I would say yes, but it's something we need to keep constant review of. And I would say today yes, because I know, having looked at um, the information that we've had about numbers of students in the past few weeks coming to wellbeing support from whatever route um, and how quickly they've been seen and the support they've had, at the moment it feels right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as, as you probably all know, there's been a huge amount of work and investment to get to that point, to get to that much better place. Does that create for us a, a stable uh, platform for the future? I don't know. And that's what we really have to constantly reflect on, whether we've got enough resource, enough support, given um, the sets of, of, of changes that we see and challenges throughout society. So today, yes, but something absolutely to keep under review. Thank or. So the board recently covered the university's failure to inform victims of the group chat who returned this year that two of the perpetrators banned for one year would not be back on campus, given that you personally apologized on the BBC for failing to communicate with the victims, as well as the complainants, and in the context of the independent review outcomes promises, do you feel that you have failed the, those victims? I feel that it was a very complicated case about who had what knowledge about who was involved. This wasn't about pe the victims who had complained. This was about others who were affected. And um, personal data is protected um, as much as it possibly can be. In our new system that we have now uh, launched, where we will have a liaison officer to work with students, that situation won't happen again because we'll have people who will directly be working with, informing, connecting uh, those who have complained, those who are affected, with where the developments are. I am really sorry, I am really sorry that you ran that story because of those complaints. I'm sorry that happened. Uh, I want it not to happen again, and that's why we've set up this part of the system that we have, having student layers and officers, two layers with students, so they can understand where we are in the process, what's going on, what will happen next, um, and to the extent to which it's um, possible and desirable advance information about what's coming out. Roll. On a somewhat related note, there has been a rise in the number of hate crime incidents in Canley and the area surrounding the, the university. What lies behind this trend and how is the university ensuring student safety off campus? So the, um, the Canley challenge uh, specifically is um, because of the rise of gangs in country. Okay. That's specifically the problem and there, are, there have been two particular gangs who have been fighting turf wars in, in Coventry um, with two different sets of descriptions. Um, one has suffered a significant um, attrition by the police and the other hasn't. And the one that hasn't has caused some real challenges in Canada. We've worked very closely with the police on this. Um, a number of the people who were affected are Chinese nationals, so we work very closely with the Chinese embassy on this as well. And in fact, I had a meeting with people in the Chinese embassy um, just last week uh, where we were reviewing what we're doing this year and what kind of support we're giving. So support has included, for example, putting on minibuses um, to support people getting there and back. Um, at the moment, uh, the situation seems a lot better, but that, that you, you can't be too complacent about that. You know, there's a lot more resources, a lot more work going in there. So there is a very particular set of issues, I think, around those very particular um, um, uh, hate crimes, as you quite rightly call them in, in Cambly. Now, there's a wider problem. And the wider problem which you spent a moment on as well, which is, as we, as we all know, I think if you look at this, the challenge across the country around hate crimes um, has grown quite significantly in the last three and a bit years. Um, and we all know what happened three and a bit years ago. So uh, how we as a community uh, engage with that is really important. Um, one of the really key roles, I think, for us in terms of, of a community and the university in terms of talking about values is, is just to be very, very clear that hate crime is unacceptable must never be accepted and we have to talk about that and not just assume it um, and I think um, you know, 
probably one of the things that I've been guilty of in the last few years is assuming that and not saying it enough. So hate crime is unacceptable. Uh, one of the things that we had at the beginning of this year for the welcome for the new incoming uh, first year students when uh, Ben Yushin and I stand up and do our, uh, our double act um, is to say that very explicitly hate crime is unacceptable, zero tolerance. You do it, you are found guilty of it, you're out. So, obviously, you've been talking a lot about the review, um, but how is the univers university fostering a more in general, what measures are being taken to foster a more accepting view on campus, specifically, more immediately? So people from different backgrounds, be people of different sexual orientations, religions, ethnic ethnicities, all in the wake of the group chat scandal, what, what's being done to foster this view that will be accepted, that is accepted by others? But not necessarily all students. So this is this is this is the crucial university and community work. Mm. Um, so going back to something I was just talking about, one of the one of the things I and others I think um, are in reflection now are very clear about is that we weren't explicit enough. So the first thing is to be very explicit mm. in a lot of the existing fora that we have. So in the sense of mainstreaming a lot of that work about values. So uh, inclusion in that sense that you have just described is a core thing that we now will talk about. We also have um, you know, the creation of our new social inclusion committee. Um, that's that's uh, a part of the, the governance mechanism, as it were, which reports into Senate and reports into the University Council. Um, we have resources that we're putting into, into that as well. We have uh, a training program, which is going on at the moment for all senior managers in the university uh, around different aspects of uh, inclusion and exclusion. Um, we have, through IATL, a lot of work on uh, workshops, on, on again, kind of mainstreaming and working through these um, these issues very directly. So um, a lot of mechanisms, um, a lot of discourse, um, a lot of explicitness. What we haven't had yet is the second part of your question, uh, which is the pushback. That's what we haven't had yet. So, um, and I'm sure you are right. Uh, I'm sure that there will be at some stages people who will push back against this element for whatever reason, whatever, whatever piece of ideology comes forward at that point, and, and then we will be put to a test. We were put to a test as a university in terms of our processes and procedures, and we'll be put to a test as a community. And, and I think you know, you're right to say that's coming, and we need to be ready for it. But now, I think the work is very much about about just just being very explicit, building that messaging, and, and doing a lot of that kind of work, and doing things that perhaps a year ago we wouldn't have thought we wouldn't have thought a year ago about having a training course mm. for heads of department and vice chancellors and others about these sorts of things because we know it. That's not good enough anymore. Mm. So that's, that's part of the work, I think, at this stage, and then we have to reflect and see where we are probably at the point at which, as I say, we get some pushback. Thank you. Following on from that, how do you think you'll, it, or the university can balance this idea of student activism with the idea of free speech? So how is that going to, because obviously, in lines, it falls with everything we've been asking, sort of surrounding from the group chat to including more groups within the university in society so how is that going to be balanced with free speech but also managed or observed by people within the university yeah yeah so <clears throat> i sort of wish we'd stopped before you asked that question because that's so it is for, for all of us it's so hard so we have um a, a duty in law uh, to allow free speech on campus so so any free speech must be allowed on campus by law um but what is free speech so if I start abusing you now, is that free speech or is that just abuse? If, if I give you four or five arguments why you're wrong to ask whatever question, that feels to me like free speech. Mm. So I, I just think that there's a, there's a duty on all of us to be, be very clear what is and isn't free speech. Yeah. Uh, it's a very difficult legal space to get into. Um, I know that because I've had to have several briefings from some lawyers uh, around these sorts of issues. Um, but for a university in particular, academic freedom, our, our version, as it were, of free speech, is about argument that is evidenced and referenced, mm -hmm. not abuse, which is just held through social media or wherever. And, and that's the sort of distinction that I think it's really important for us to work with and, 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 and try to, to live up to on campus. Sort of following on from everything we've been talking about throughout this interview, you, a lot of the things are going to be working, improving lives for us as students. So how do you think, or are the university working on improving sort of the trust 
between the university and students because obviously you were talking about all these transport things, things to do with study spaces and ways to make it more a more inclusive society. Sort of in the wake of the group chat scandal, obviously a lot of trust has been lost. What do you think is the best way that you are using to go about rebuilding this trust and are you doing so? So um, let me give you two answers to that if I might. One, one is it, it, it depends what you mean because you know many students tell me that their relationship with the university is actually their relationship with their department mm -hmm. and the people who are teaching them in that kind yeah. of context. So that trust I don't think has been affected no. in any particular ways. You know, Overall, mm -hmm. overall, by, by none of those issues. So, uh, you know, in one sense, at that level, that kind of everyday connection is still there, yeah. is still strong, is still real. Um, in terms of the university, in the way mm -hmm. we're now describing capital T, capital U, uh, our, our um, uh, structured functional engagement has been with the student union. Mm -hmm. um, that's that is in that statutes. That's the way that we engage. That's a really important piece of, of work, and student union represented on, on all the all the committees and subcommittees that make uh, make decisions. Um, and we are working to work closely together again, as we had done over the previous few years, about seeing what are the joint programs of work that we can push through over the course of next year. And actually, no, that was true last year as well. So we had a big package of, of education reforms which went through Senate in July. And um, that would never have happened without really close collaboration with Larissa uh, and with others in the, in the student union. So, you know, there have been some really important pieces of work. It's a much more mixed message of that sort. The other thing to say, though, is, of course, is that there's a general challenge of how a big institution communicates with an individual <coughs> about anything. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to do, because you don't want to just fill that full of propaganda, that's no good, and smart people see through that instantaneously. So we need to find, and we are working on this at the moment, a whole series of other people to talk about, to be that, play that kind of intermediary role, so student bloggers, for example, mm -hmm. to say what it is and what they're going on, what's going on and what they've seen. So trying to find more space for student bloggers, student ambassadors, to make some of those connections is another really important part of that, of that program work. But I just think it's a much more, much more mixed picture than mm -hmm. uh, there's one line of communication, one line of trust, one line of relations mm -hmm. to, be to, to be built back up. Thank you. I suppose we're at one minute past the hour, so... <laughs> 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 Thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for your questions.